and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to learn about the 1970 movie called Little Big Man, directed by Arthur Penn and based on the novel by Thomas Berger of the same name, Little Big Man tells the story of Jack Crabb, who claims to be the sole white survivor of the Battle of Little Bighorn, or as it's commonly called, Custer's Last Stand. Throughout the movie, we see a lot of the stereotypes that you'd expect in a Western film from the 1970s, as well as coming across some real historical names that you'll recognize, like Wild Bill Hickok and, of course, George Armstrong Custer. To help us separate fact from fiction in the movie, we'll be chatting with Professor Gregory J.W. Irwin from Temple University. Gregory is an author and historian who has written extensively about military history, including a book all about Custer called Custer Victorious, the Civil War Battles of General George Armstrong Custer. Before we connect with Gregory, though, let's set up our game. Two truths and a lie. Now, if you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm going to give you three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is an all-out lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Jack Crabb was a fictional character. Number two. Custer wanted to win at Little Bighorn so he would be nominated for president. Number three, there really was such a thing as a contrary among the Cheyenne. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to identify which one is the lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to connect with Gregory J.W. Irwin, about the historical accuracy of Little Big Men. Overall, if you were to give the movie Little Big Man a letter grade for historical accuracy, what would it get? It would not be a high grade for historical accuracy. The film does a tremendous job of puncturing a lot of the mythology that surrounded uh, white Americans' view of the West. I mean, it's based on a satiric novel, and and it carries on with that spirit, just you know, giving us the behind-the-scenes view of what a lot of these people were really like, or what these types were really like. So, from that point of view, I think it does a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous service. Uh, to people interested in Western history, you just have to be, uh, you have to avoid getting uh, uh, pulled in by some of the false particulars. Uh, also, the film does a good job, I think, of capturing life among the Cheyenne. From a historical point of view, I think that's its, its strongest contribution. Right up front, I do want to clarify, you mentioned the novel, the novel from 1964 by Thomas Berger of, of the same name. And I want to clarify the historical accuracy of the main character, Jack Crabb. He's played by Dustin Hoffman in the movie. It's The entire movie is told from the perspective of Jack, and he's over 100 years old as he recounts stories from his life. Little Big Man is Jack's name when he lived with the Indians. And the whole movie has a feel of kind of a biographical movie about Jack, but of course, it is based on a novel. So the impression I got while watching the movie was Jack is probably this fictional person used as an excuse to piece together all a lot of different people and events from history that are real. Do we know if Jack Crabb was based on a real person? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm the sole white survivor of the Battle <laughs> of the Little Bighorn. Uh, no. <laughs> Never wrote to Jack Crabb. Uh, he, he's he's a, a fictional device that allows us to navigate through a lot of the madness. It was part of Western Western expansion. So, uh, no, there's there's no Jack Crab, but there should have been. <laughs> he's a great narrator. He's delightful in many ways. Uh, there were a lot of people who claimed to su- have survived the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and they were quickly proven to be frauds. One who wasn't was a, was a fellow named Frank Finkel who was claimed to have been an enlisted man on the set with cavalry who somehow escaped uh, and ended up uh, arriving more dead than alive in a homestead 
uh, somewhere out in Montana territory inhabited by two white guys. One of them was sickly and died, and Frank stayed on working the spread. Um, and, and his story, in many ways, was, was kind of low-key. Uh, some of what he said was plausible. And he has his following, but I don't think Frank was there either. Probably the last member of Custer's immediate command to get out of the battle was a Crow scout named Curly. And he was the one who brought the news to the supply boat that was supporting uh, the uh, United States troops in the Yellowstone country of the far west that Custer and his, uh, his troopers had been exterminated by the Lakota and the Cheyenne. Problem was he didn't speak English. And the people that, uh, that he first contacted, the white people he first contacted, didn't speak Crow. And through pantomime and sign language, uh, he got the essential story out. But then when newspaper reporters got their hands on it, they sensationalized it. They have Curly next to Custer at, at the last moments of the last stand saying, here's a Sioux blanket. Wrap this around yourself and we'll get you out of the battle. We'll save your life. And Custer says, no, Curly, you take the blanket. Uh, which was just, Curly never said that, but it got wrapped. And for a long time, he was thought to be a fraud. But when people, uh, the historians, uh, got down to the raw stuff of what he said, they parted company with Custer before Custer went down Medicine Tail Coulee, watched the battle from a distance, and then he, he took his leave. So an Indian should get that credit rather than, than a fictional white guy. I remember you just mentioned his name, Frank, uh, the, the guy who uh, potentially claimed to have, have escaped. But if he just stayed on somewhere, wouldn't that then be deserting? His story was kept under wraps for a long time because of that fear that he'd be charged with desertion. Okay, okay yeah, so he that. used that as a thing. Yeah, yeah. That was my excuse for not saying anything. For, you know, <laughs> there was no one around who could contradict me and say, I didn't serve with any Frank Michael. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we will talk about some of the other characters that are, we know are real, like like General Custer. But what about some of the other characters that we see in the movie, like Old Lodgkins, Younger Bear, or Mrs. Pendrake, or any of the main characters in the movie based on real people? Well, Old Lodgkins and Younger Bear are um, shy and archetypes, you know. Well, they're, they're, they, they embody uh, certain certain aspects of that culture and that society. Mrs. Pendrake, she is the uh, arch-Victorian hypocrite, a woman who uh, professes great faith in Jesus and adherence to his teachings, you know, just a symbol of, of Christian uh, uprightness and purity, but her husband doesn't satisfy her sexually, and she goes seeking that satisfaction somewhere else and ends up becoming a, becoming a whore, becoming a prostitute, as if the uh, director is saying that's what these women who put themselves on uh, put themselves on pedestals really are uh, it's kind of a misogynistic view uh but but she serves serves uh that purpose to uh you know more or less say well white society at that, at that time it had a lot of had a lot of holes in it yeah. Yeah. well early on in the movie uh, well jack is a child he and his sister are the only survivors of an attack by a band of pawnee his whole family's gone. And then a Cheyenne brave named shadow that comes in sight, finds the two kids, takes them back to his village. And there's a brief bit of dialogue where Jack says he didn't know the difference between Pawnee and Cheyenne at the time. And this is kind of a common theme throughout the entire movie with the Pawnee and Cheyenne nations fighting against each other. But we don't get a lot of explanation about that in the movie. Can you fill in some historical context around the relationship between the Pawnee and Cheyenne nations at the time? Yeah, this is not the only time uh, Hollywood uh, hit would use the Pawnee as the Indian villains. Uh, Dances with Wolves does the same thing. The Pawnee are the bad Indians preying on the, on the wonderful uh, Lakota or Sioux. Uh, the Pawnee were uh, among several Central Plains tribes who uh, in the early, well, throughout the 18th century, began feeling pressure from uh, migrating peoples coming out of the Great Lakes area, the Lakota and the Dakota, two branches of the Sioux family, the Cheyenne. These people invaded Pawnee territory and had depopulated the Pawnee. At the beginning of the 18th century, the Pawnee had about uh, 60,000 people. Uh, by 1860, that number had been reduced to 4,000 by attacks from these various aggressive uh, newcomers 
uh, and also exposure to white diseases and things like that. And the Pawnee, in order to survive, they become allies of another powerful group entering the plains, white Americans. And the Pawnee will uh, uh, serve their new allies quite well during the 1860s and 1870s that they uh, served as scouts for the army. Two white brothers, Frank and Luther North, formed what was known as the Pawnee Battalion. And these guys, I mean, they had a score or so, but they, they were extremely good at finding and fighting other Indians. And I think because of this association with the U.S. Army, they're going to be cast as the bad guys, and they're going to do something improbable. They're going to attack and destroy a white wagon train. No, that, that's not what they would do. They might come in and trade, but no, they're, they're not going to wage war on the whites. They need the whites in order to survive. That, again, goes back to, I guess, what we were just talking about with Jack Crabb and, and using him as a character there. So, of course, they have to get him living with the Cheyenne somehow. <laughs> and if the enemy of, of the Cheyenne in the movie are, are Pawnee. The Cheyenne and the Pawnee were our enemies. Uh, they engaged in a number of bloody battles. One time, the Pawnee decisively defeated the Cheyenne and captured a bundle of arrows, the medicine arrows. These were relics sacred to the Cheyenne that supposedly embodied their connection with, with God. And the Cheyenne had to lay off them for a while, but this gave the Cheyenne then uh, uh, an extra reason to go after the Pawnee too, because in effect they had defiled their, uh, their spiritual relics. In the movie, after Jack goes, he goes, after he leaves the um, Cheyenne, he goes to live in a nearby town. There's a quote from the Reverend Pendrick character as the husband of Miss and Pendrick we talked about earlier. And we're going to quote it from the movie here. He says, the Indians know nothing of God and moral rights. They eat human flesh, fornicate, adulterize, misogynize, and commune constantly with minions of the devil. It must be our task, nay, our Christian duty to beat the misery out of, and then he gets cut off before he goes on. But I got the sense that he's kind of verbalizing something that many others at the time believed. Is that how white settlers saw the Indian nations in the timeline of the movie? Well, a lot of them probably, or at least elements of that. I mean, he's giving a catalog of why white seed Indians. And uh, like his wife, he's an archetype too. He represents kind of the Calvinist strain, you know, the strict religious strain, the militant Christian strain in American society. And so these people, they, they don't know Jesus, so they must be spawns of the devil. And that just, of course, give whites justification, gives them whites justification or taking their land and killing them if, if they resist. And, and once they stop resisting, you know, uh, Christianizing them at gunpoint, <laughs> more or less, that kind of thing. Yeah, you will believe this or else, basically. <laughs> no, no. Well, we'll take your children, we'll send them to school in the East, cut their hair, teach them English, completely alienate them from you. And as for the rest of you, back on the reservation, if you want to keep eating, you've got to cooperate. Was that was that sort of pressure something that was really put on the Indian nations then? Oh, yeah, especially after the armed resistance ended. And I think that's probably the cruelest thing that the United States and uh, uh, the uh, American society did to the Native peoples, because it wasn't enough that we are going to strip you of your lifestyle, that we are going to confine you to limited spaces that really we do not consider uh, worthy of white settlement, but we are going to transform you into white people. We are going to strip you of your identity. We're going to tell you that everything you believed is wrong. You, you can't have that anymore. And, you know, it's bad enough being defeated in war. It's bad enough being confined. Uh, but, you know, to have that mind game played on you, that helps to account for a lot of the demoralization. That, that affected Native peoples, but it still affects some of them. So you know, I, I consider that the greatest crime. It's kind of a spiritual genocide rather than an actual wiping out a, a people. In some ways, you are wiping out a people. One of the more colorful characters that we see in the movie is Mr. Allardyce T. Merriweather. <laughs> he's so over the top. Every time we see the movie, he's missing more things. He's got missing, I think it was his left hand. Uh, he's got peg leg, missing eye. And of course, Jack works with him as a snake oil salesman. 
almost literally at one point there was, we see that Meriwether had snake heads in the magic elixir that he was selling. How common were these snake oil salesmen in the American Old West? Uh, well, uh, not just in the West. The medicine man, the snake oil salesman, with his traveling medicine show, was something of a staple throughout rural America, including the more settled areas. These people would travel around. They would put on some sort of show, whether they had assisted in, in blackface, doing some minstrel mystery or magic tricks, whatever. Anything to gather a crowd. Then you go into your sales pitch. So it's kind of like American television. Here's entertainment. <laughs> uh, and the stuff that they sold, of course, well, uh, consumer beware. Because it could poison or, or you, know, uh, you uh, either make you sick, maybe even uh, make you blind or kill you. This um, enterprise or these enterprises became so notorious that uh, a lot of people w wouldn't purchase over-the-counter medicines uh, from regular stores. You know, you wouldn't take something that wasn't prescribed by a doctor that you trusted at pharmacist that you trusted. It wasn't until the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, something that was pushed by Theodore Roosevelt, part of his agenda of progressive reforms, but also something that was supported by the big pharmaceutical companies because they wanted customers to trust their products. But it wasn't it, and, until then when, when the federal government began to regulate uh, drugs, uh, remedies, et cetera, that uh, people began to feel safe about what they were ingesting and had better reason to feel safe too. So this kind of stuff was going all through, these kinds of shows are going on all throughout the 19th century. I didn't even think about that, how that would affect the trust of things that you get from other places as well. What might be, you know, a reputable store in town or, or where, wherever, um, you might not think it's as reputable because this other person said they were reputable too. Of course, they leave town after they, after you you buy from them, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> the surest thing, uh, or the surest way to make big business behave responsibly is to make it work their walk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, repeat customers. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, we talked about a lot of the, the fictional characters, but if we go back to the movie, one of the most famous historical figures that Jack Crabb runs into is Wild Bill Hickok. And that uh, Jack is going through his gunfighter phase of his life at the time when we first see him. And at this point, we see Hickok, he's sitting with his back against a bench so he can watch everyone. He seems very jumpy. And then it kind of seems to be for good reason. He goes to the bar to get another bottle. And while his back is turned, someone tries to kill him. But Hickok is a faster draw. He kills that man. And then later on in the movie, Jack runs into Hickok again. This time he asks Jack to deliver something to a woman that Hickok had an affair with so his wife doesn't find out. And then after the chat, just as Jack is leaving the saloon, there's a gunshot. He turns around, sees that Hickok is shot. He dies soon thereafter. The young man who shot Hickok is yelling that Hickok killed his dad, took seven years, but finally got him. So those are... Brief summary, of course, of the two major scenes where we see Wild Bill Hickok in the movie. Was the Wild Bill Hickok that we see in the movie anything like the real man? James Butler, Wild Bill Hickok. Uh, I think that depiction in the film, uh, it resonates with the truth. Uh, Jeff Corey, was, was all, uh, who plays Wild Bill, he's older than Wild Bill was at the time that Hickok was killed, but he's got the, the look right. Yeah, you know, Hickok became kind of the paradigm for the celebrity gunslinger. Uh, part of that he brought on himself. He exaggerated some of his exploits, but there were plenty of other people who were willing to exaggerate them too. Dime novelists, unscrupulous journalists, et cetera. So this was a guy who had to watch his back, literally, and develop the custom when he, he liked to gamble. When he sat down at a poker table, he wanted to see with his back to the door so no one could come up behind him and murder him. I don't know if he was as jumpy. Every time he hears a noise, he's pulling a pistol, et cetera. But, you know, it kind of conveys uh, the, the desperate side of his lifestyle. And this is a theme that gets, uh, uh, well, uh, Gregory Peck uh, uh, did a movie, I believe, in the 50s. I think it was called The Gunfighter. 
and he's in the same predicament. And then John Wayne's last movie, The Shootist. The Shootist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, he's a celebrity gunfighter, and there are people who want to prove that they're better, better man than he is, or out, out to kill him. So Hitchcock too, he's careful about his own safety, but he had a facility for making friends. There are people who are really loyal to him, who, uh, who uh, admired him, who enjoyed his company. And some of that comes out in, in his mentoring of Jack Crabb, you know, doesn't treat him as a competitor or someone I've got to eliminate before he tries to kill me. And I like that aspect of it. Hickok, you know, will hold a variety of occupations, be a soldier during the Civil War, scout. Uh, he scouts for Custer in 1867. He later scouts from the 10th U.S. Cavalry, the Black Buffalo Soldiers. It's believed he did a little cattle rustling, uh, but he's a lawman. Uh, in a variety of places, most most uh, famously Abilene, Kansas. He likes to gamble. He, he staged a couple of his own little Wild West uh, shows, traveling shows. He becomes an actor. Uh, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody and Texas Jack Alejandro hire him for a show that they're staging in the East. He turns on. He turns on. He didn't like it. He hide behind props when he was supposed to be on stage. Once he shot out uh, a spotlight with a pistol that was supposed to only be armed with, with blanks. Uh, uh, remember that Alec Baldwin, uh, there are stories too, that, uh, you know, the show was about frontier scouts foiling, um, uh, villainous Indians that, uh, he would fire the blanks from his pistol during uh, fight scenes too close to the, the legs of the, uh, Indian extras, which burn him. Kind of thing. So he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's a man of, of many parts. He's killed in Deadwood, uh, the Dakota Territory, during the gold rush there in the latter part of the 1870s, uh, not by someone avenging a slain uh, father. Uh, Jack McCall was involved in a, in a uh, poker game with uh, Hickok and some other fellows, and he was drunk and he was losing badly. And Hickok said, you know, why don't you just uh, leave the table, cut your losses, here's some money, buy yourself some breakfast. And supposedly that act of charity uh, humiliated McCall. And so he'd come back the next day and Hickok was sat down to a game, asked uh, people to move so he could sit with his back to the wall and they didn't. And so he's exposed and, and McCall comes up behind him and shoots him on the head. McCall's t- tried twice. Uh, the first time he gets off, the second time they, 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 they sentence him to death and he's hanged. That's fascinating because, I mean, it sounds almost a different scenario, of course, but almost similar to what we see with Jack Crabb in the movie because Jack Crabb is, he kind of becomes a drunk and is in the middle of the mud and stuff. And then it's Hickok that sees him, gives him some money to go clean up and, and, and then come back. And that's leading into the sequence you just talked about in the saloon, you know, delivering a message to this woman and then with, with Hickok dying. But it sounds like maybe there were some elements that they pulled from the real story and that humiliation aspect, but then it turned, it was not obviously humiliating for Jack Crabb, the hero in the movie, but uh, it, I see some correlations there. I'm not, not sure if the filmmakers did that. But. Yeah, what did they do it now? Well, I could see Hitch, Hickok doing that in real life. Yeah. You mentioned him a little bit ago and another major historical figure that Jack meets in the movie is General George Armstrong Custer, and he clearly makes an immediate impression on Jack. The way that Richard Mulligan plays Custer in the movie, he just he just seems very vain. Uh, for example, I can give some examples of how the movie does it, and we'll, we'll see how, how accurate that is. But uh, Jack asks Custer for a job as a scout. Custer goes on. He's talking to one of the other soldiers there. He, he talks about how he can tell a man's occupation just by looking at him. And Jack's no scout. He's a mule skinner. So he hires Jack as a mule skinner, which, of course, is ridiculous. It's not something that Jack has done. Um, there are numerous times throughout the movie where the men around Custer just seem to be yes men because of Custer's vanity, like how he gets onto the major under his command. I don't know if they ever say who the major is. He's just cast as major. Just major. So you know, that's that's that credit that's a credit given Alan Oppenheimer, that actor. Just major. Yeah, he just major, which which again kind of leads to okay, Custer and then everybody else, right? And <laughs> the major under his command, he uh he says something and then Custer is like, stop trying to cause a reversal of a Custer decision. 
he, referring to himself in the third person. Uh, there's even a brief scene I noticed where Custer pauses to look at himself in the mirror before continuing on. Was Custer really as vain as the movie makes him out to be? Well, the Mulligan uh, characterization, which is just, uh, I mean, <laughs> it, it's there. To, I mean, he, he does what the director and the script want him to do. He's the epitome of bombast. You know, he, he's a guy who thinks highly of himself. He's reached a position of high authority, God knows how. And uh, he just thinks he knows everything and can do no wrong. And, and whatever he wants is right. Well, you know, there's something of that, I think, in almost all of us, but it, it's highly exaggerated in this case. Was Custer vain? Well, uh, he certainly cared about his appearance. There were certain images at certain points of his life that he wanted to project. Um, he adopted a, a unique costume or costumes during the Civil War, partially to let his men know where he was, uh, but also. He wanted to look like a dashing hussar, you know, or the epitome of the uh, uh, dashing uh, light calverman. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, when he got out west, he uh, uh, doffed the regulation uniform, at least when he was on campaign, and tried to dress like a frontier scout uh, in buckskins and uh, you know, kind of fill that Natty Bumpo uh, leather stocking or deer slayer role while he was uh, chasing chasing his various Indian prey. As uh, an officer, the 7th Cavalry Regiment, which he commanded from 1866 to 1876, was highly polarized. Um, there was a, a clique of officers who were quite loyal to Custer, and he enjoyed their company, to be sure. Uh, he included his brother, Tom, two-time recipient of the, of the Medal of Honor, so he was no slouch as a soldier. His brother-in-law, James James Calhoun and old Civil War friend George Yates, several others I'm not going to mention. And then there was a clique of officers who despised him. One in particular, Captain Frederick Benteen, liked to go out of his way to argue with Custer, to, to throw shade on Custer, whatever he could. He would continue to do that after Custer's death. So Custer kind of uh, developed uh, a, a command behavior where he didn't ask for advice. He had an officer's uh, call. He would say, this is what we're doing. Bam, 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 bam. You know, make sure that your troops uh, uh, comply. And whoever's the last ready to get on the trail will, will be at the, at the end of the column, choking everyone else's dust, et cetera, et cetera. Just before the Little Bighorn, he uh, had an officer's uh, call, and he did ask for advice. And it took everybody by surprise officer named Edward Godfrey, kind of like Custer, said he'd never done that before. But saying, like, you know, it's going to reverse the Custer decision, blah, 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 blah. You know, and that, that, those words never, never passed his lips. He didn't have it. Said, I'm, you know, I, I'm Lieutenant Colonel commanding this regiment, gentlemen, and this is what we're doing. <laughs> to try to buck that, at least too strongly, you could be up for insubordination. But, you know, he was, he was certainly self-confident. He had made a reputation as an Indian fighter at the Battle of the Washita, which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, in detail in a little bit. Uh, he uh, outfought the Sioux in, in two skirmishes along the Yellowstone River in 1873, which I think convinced him he could handle those people under any circumstances. Uh, and they ended up doing the unexpected at the Little Bighorn. So they caught him making mistakes, and they made the most of that. I mean, there were reasons to dislike Custer, to think he was conceited, et cetera. But this idea of his, of his constantly primping, when he was on campaign, he grew his hair out. Uh, he's wearing, you know, rough field dress, et cetera. He would wait till he got home to shave and clean up and then pose for the photographs by which so many people judge him. Which makes sense. You go out and, I mean, it's, you're not going to have the comforts of home, not, you know, the comforts of home that we think of now are very different than even the comforts of home that they had, you know, back then, but out on, um, on campaign, it would be, it would be different. Uh, you mentioned what Custer was wearing and correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're currently wearing is a, uh, Custer replica, correct? Yeah, it's a reproduction of, of, uh, the, the overshirt that Custer wore, uh, when he was campaigning on the Northern Plains in 1873, 1874. And, and 1876. 
It was uh, originally known as a cowboy shirt. It had a bib front, uh, came with a variety of colors, and it was loose fitting, had a big pocket to carry extra tackle, as, as people called it, et cetera. You know, it was durable, and it was just popular, popular wear in the West. A number of cu Custer's officers wore shirts like that. So this would have been under his, his buckskin jacket, which he removed at the Little Bighorn. It was a, a hot day, and uh, uh, the last uh, troopers who lived who saw him said he had tied it to the back of his saddle uh, and was in, a, in his shirt sleeves when he uh, entered Me Medicine Jail Cooley. Yeah, he may have dressed differently, but that's not necessarily unique to him. No, other officers wore buckskin too. His brother Tom, uh, other people outside of the Custer Circle. Buckskin was durable. Uh, instead of messing up your regulation uniform when you're out for three or four months uh, on an extended camp out, uh, that, that just seemed to be, be more practical to a lot of these guys. I guess there's a form and function and there's a time for form and there's a time for function when, when functionality works. <laughs> but there's a certain style to it too. You know, look at me, I'm Davy Crockett, I'm Daniel Boone, a great white hunter. <laughs> you mentioned the Washito River and according to the movie, the Cheyenne are given a tract of land by the Washita River. They're supposed to be safe there, at least according to the movie. But then before long, we see soldiers coming, some on horses, some on foot, and the soldiers are led by Custer. He makes the point in the movie to remind his men that they're not to shoot the women unless, of course, they refuse to surrender. But there doesn't seem to be any attempt of capturing anyone. We see soldiers just rushing through the Cheyenne village, burning teepees, killing everyone, men, women, and children. To put it bluntly, it just looks like a massacre. Did that really happen? Well, one thing to keep in mind, this movie is released in 1970 at the height of the Vietnam War. And Arthur Penn uses the Battle of the Washita as a thinly disguised uh, a way of condemning the U.S. Army for the atrocities it committed in uh, Vietnam. When you look at the Washita, you're looking at uh, the My Lai Massacre. I uh, mean, Jack Crabb's wife, they cast an Asian actress to play her. She's not a Native American. You know, the, the thing about uh, these Indians living in, on land that was theirs for all eternity, as long as the grass shall grow and the rivers flow, etc. The uh, Treaty of Medicine Lodge, which was concluded in 1867, the year before the Washita tragedy, it staked out a Cheyenne reservation. But the Washita area was not within those parameters. The Indians didn't like the land that the whites said, this is your new home. So in the wintertime, um, as was their want, they would come together in large numbers to live off the, uh, the pemmican, the dried buffalo meat uh, that they had gathered uh, during the warmer weather and just kind of hole up. It was time to uh, socialize with friends. The, the village that Jack Crabb inhabited, uh, he won't say it in the movie, but, but it was headed by a chief named Black Kettle, was one of a series of villages of uh, Cheyenne, Kiowa, Arapaho in the Washita uh, Valley. Now, Black Kettle was reputed to be a peace chief, which I think was true. Uh, but, you know, he had his own idea of what peace was. As the movie conveys, the Indian society was not highly structured. It tolerated a great deal of individuality. And you could be a peace chief and tell your young men, do not war on the whites. And some of your young men would listen, and some of your young men would not. And there were raids going on in western Kansas in the months preceding this battle. In fact, Custer's Osage scouts, these were Indians who were fighting on the side of the, or the, on the, side of the whites. You know, one thing to remember is that Custer fought against Indians, but he also fought for Indians. Indians who had been oppressed by the Indians who were his target of the day. Uh, but the Osage scouts uh, uh, traced... Uh, the trail of a war party coming out of western Kansas to Black Kettle's camp. That's what brought Custer's 7th Cavalry to that area. Now, you know, it wasn't very policy to kill Indian women and children. Males, you know, even when it wasn't said explicitly, no one expected you to bring back male prisoners. And this would, would include boys who were old enough to bear arms. But, uh, you know, women and children, you know, there was this vestige of Victorian uh, chivalry. But when you attack an urban area 
as the American military has done as recently as Iraq, and bullets are flying through an urban area, a lot of non-competents can be killed, especially if they're living in buffalo skin lodges, which are not bulletproof. Also, you attack an urban area, uh, and this would be the same thing if, if Indians attacked a white settlement or a white homestead, some of the women and people we might consider kids would pick up weapons in their own defense. So you go charging at this thing, uh, swirling through, and bullets are flying, and you see somebody moving, and you're not sure if they have a weapon or not, just like police today, we're in their hot pursuit. You shoot first, and you ask questions later. There was some, probably uh, some uh, cavalry troopers who acted with bad blood. They had seen friends who were killed and mutilated by the Indians, or they just shared the gen general prejudice of their society against Indians and felt, well, you know, the fewer Indians there are, the less problems there'll be for us whites in the West. And then there are others who are either taking fire or afraid that they might. The Osage scouts were deliberately killing every Cheyenne they could get, they could cut, they could get their hands on, including women and children who obviously were, you know, defenseless. Custer will intervene, and uh, more than fifty-five Cheyenne women and children will be spared. They'll be carried back to his base. So Custer will stop the promiscuous murder of non-competence, but a large number were killed. So massacre, yeah, uh, yeah there, were there, were, there were certainly uh, massacre moments in the Battle of the Washita, but like a lot of uh, things that happen in history, the nuance gets lost when it's put on film. It's good guy versus bad guy. One part of the, of the Washington sequence that outraged a lot of white Americans when the movie first aired was Custer's order to kill the Indian pony herd. A lot of animal lovers were upset by that, and I can understand that. But that was a sound military decision. The pony was an Indian man's, it was his source of wealth, his source of standing, but it also was his means of mobility for making war and also for gathering food hunting buffalo, you take away the enemy's ponies and they have no choice but to turn themselves in and live off white charity on their reservation. I mean, as much sense of, as destroying German tanks after battle. I mean, it, it's, it's harsh, not fun to look at. And if Custer tried to bring, herd those ponies back to uh, Camp Supply, his base in what is today Oklahoma, Young Indian men, they would have stolen most of them back on the marsh. That, that was one of their, their major skills, uh, stealing horses uh, from, from rival tribes and from whites. So it made the most sense to just eliminate those ponies, except for the ones he used to mount Indian women and children for the return trip to his base. But uh, again, you know, you leave out certain facts and a, and a different kind of picture emerges. Uh, one thing with the way the movie portrays it, because it follows Jack Crab and he's in the camp there when it gets attacked, we don't see things from Custer's side. So did Custer know, and you said there were, there were scouts that um, traced a warrior party to that camp. Did Custer know that he, he was, what he was going into? Was he kind of following that or what, what was his mindset into it? Cause you mentioned, you know, massacre moments. And it sounds to me like maybe things kind of got out of hand beyond what he oh, was yeah. expecting. It, it often do in combat. Uh, that's an excellent question though. The hardest thing about fighting plains Indians was finding them or catching them because they, their horses were better adapted to life on the plains. They were quicker. Uh, those ponies that, than the average white horse, they could live entirely on grass. Uh, cavalry horses could graze on grass, but they also needed a pretty steady diet of, of oats, which meant you got to haul along large quantities of oats, which would slow you down. You know, I'm trying to chase Indians with, with a wagon train. That's like uh, uh, trying to run uh, 400 meters with a ball and chain. They'd find a village. The Osage say, yeah, there's a village. Custer goes out with some Osage and they could, they can smell it. They can smell the campfires, at cetera. And Custer says, okay, let's attack. He doesn't make a careful reconnaissance. He had tried doing that in 1867, surrounding an idiot camp. And when he went in in the morning, they were all gone. They had infiltrated out. 
So you don't give them a chance to sound the alarm. You don't give them a chance to run. You just hit. Uh, and you kind of sort it out afterwards. And so he hits this camp. You know, they will find uh, Booty from uh, Plundered Kansas Homesteads. There's a white woman, a captive, Clara Blinn, and her young son, Willie, in the village. Um, they won't find them at the time, but when they come back to the Washington afterwards, they will find that both have been murdered by their Indian captors rather than let them be uh, retaken by the white soldiers. But there's something else that Custer doesn't know about. That camp he attacks is just one in a string of villages along the Washita. And when those Indians hear the sound of combat, they turn out and they are preparing to attack Custer. And that's one reason why Custer ends up being glad that he took those prisoners because in effect, they become human shields. He's able to march out uh, of the Washita Valley uh, without sustaining uh, heavier casualties and perhaps without experiencing the little bighorn uh, eight years early. You know, he was in a tight, a tight spot. And he realized that. He just didn't say, oh, more Indians, let's go charging them. He's like, well, let's get, get back to our wagon train where the ammunition is, and then uh, let's extricate the command from this tight situation. We can claim a victory, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, which is very different than <laughs> where the movie portrays it. The general idea that I got um, after the movie, of course, it doesn't say a lot about uh, Custer's mindset other than he just seems to be very vain, which we've already talked about. But the impression that I got was um, that that attack gave him confidence later on that it would be easy to do. The Washita was the first major post-Civil War victory that the U.S. Army scored against the Plains Indians. In 1866, the uh, Lakota and their allies wiped out uh, 80 soldiers outside Fort Phil Kearney in the Fetterman Massacre. And the Army ended up uh, evacuating its post along the Bozeman Trail into Montana and letting the, the, uh, the Sioux control that land. It was really the only real defeat that the Army experienced in its long uh, wars with the Native peoples. I mean, there were certain battles that it lost, but in effect, they gave up. They said, let's make peace. You guys could keep this Bozeman Trail area. But that really hurt the Army's reputation. They hurt the army's morale, and Custer scores this, this victory, a surprise attack. And that propels him to the rank of the country's foremost Indian fighter. Yeah, he's just considered, he becomes this, the symbol of the Indian fighting army. Uh, well, he was a celebrity coming out of the Civil War. His celebrity revives. Newspaper men want to interview him and, and follow him whenever he goes out on the crawl. Uh, later, when things kind of settle down on the Southern Plains, all kinds of celebrities, including British nobility, come out to hunt buffalo with General Custer. You know, he kind of, he kind of has his own dude ranch going, hosting these different people. Uh, eventually, he'll, he'll host the uh, Grand Duke Alexis of Russia, brother of the future czar, in one of these. Uh, it's kind of an early version of the Wild West show because Buffalo Bill Cody is also there and he gets some Indian friends to come and perform dances and various ceremonies to celebrate, to, to entertain the Grand Duke. And then they go out and uh, coach him so he can actually kill a buffalo <laughs> and things like that. So, yeah, boosting Custer's uh, confidence, boosting his standing. Uh, not every army commander could go out and find Indians. Uh, because when they were on guard, they were uh, you know, extremely hard to catch. Winter was different. Winter they didn't expect anyone to be crazy enough to come out on the Great Plains after them in the thick snow, but the Army was willing to. It posed discomfort and probably even frostbite on a lot of its troopers to uh, deliver some successful strikes. And that, that tactic of going after the Indians in the winter, that will be repeated by the Army uh, on the Southern Plains and also on the Northern Plains. Well, the first battle of the Great Sioux War is on, fought on March 17th, 1876, uh, against a band on Powder River, I think mostly Cheyenne. And after the Little Bighorn, they'll continue after the Indians and continue chasing them through the winter of 1876, 1877. It sounds like a after um, the Washita at uh, attack there, 
if the movie were focusing more on Custer and, and having him, just him being as vain, the things that after happened afterwards, increasing his reputation and such, I could, I, I could just picture it in my mind, how that character, that uh, character version of Custer in the movie would love <laughs> seeing uh, you know, people from other, uh, other nations around, around the world coming to see him and, uh, you know, boost his ego. And I could just see him <laughs> can picture that maybe as a, a sequel to the movie or something. I should mention though, you know, after the Washington, there were still Indian bands, uh, Kiowa uh, and uh, other Cheyennes uh, who were on the loose. And Custer was sent out after them, and he overtook two of these groups, and he chose to negotiate instead of attacking them. He chose to, to use diplomacy uh, to get them to return to their agencies. Now, I said, hey, we found you, and if you don't behave, we're going to attack you. And in one case, he played hardball. He kidnapped three chiefs and threatened to hang them unless uh, their people turned over two white female captives and promise to return to the agency. But it, it wasn't like, oh, there's some Indians there, I want to kill them, which is the the, the, uh, the impression you get from little big men. Again, nuance, nuance. I'm going to do the job. He'll do what it takes. But it's not like he wants to kill every Indian. He means he liked a lot of Indians. Some, he was one of the few white commanders on the plains who, uh, you know, most of the, the Indians who worked with the whites didn't speak English, contrary to what we see in the movies. Custer learned Indian sign language so he could communicate directly with his scouts. didn't have to go through middlemen, interpreters, who sometimes weren't as good as, as, as they were supposed to be. He's one of the few white commanders who had himself photographed with his Indian scouts. George Cook was another exception. Uh, but he liked hanging around with them. He liked learning their, their ways, their folk ways, etc. I mean, as a white Victorian, he thought himself superior to them, but there were certain elements of their life that he respected. Uh, being a hunter himself, they were great hunters. They were great trackers. And in his autobiography, My Life on the Plains, which he published in 1874, I'm going to paraphrase, but he would say, if, if I was an Indian, I would far rather resist, live a free life, than submit to reservation life where all the, the vices of white society are thrown in without or measure. Uh, so again, uh, movies deal in stereotypes. The stereotypes are, sometimes aren't, aren't as interesting as the history. It sounds like he, being in the army, you know, he has his orders of what he needs to do and um, had no issue with, with carrying that out. But it sounds like he understood the resistance. Like you're saying, they're defending their homes. There was a lot of sympathy among white army officers for the Indians. And also, we don't want to agitate these people because they, they might get in a lucky shot. <laughs> Even if we win the battle, we might get killed. Uh, but it, we'll have an unpleasant time several months trying to chase them down. So, you know, a lot of these unfair policies, treaty violations, et cetera, steamed off a lot of these uh, or steamed up a lot of these, a lot of these officers. But again, uh, they didn't give up their commissions and, and they did the job that they were ordered to do. Well, as I was watching the movie to prep for our chat, there was a line of dialogue about Custer that I knew I had to ask you about. It comes from the older Jack Crab who's telling his story. And this is, uh, I'll quote the movie directly here. It says, in my belief, Custer's hate for the Indians and his ambition had combined on him. He figured he needed one more dramatic victory over the Indians to be nominated for president of the United States. That is a true historical fact. That's the quote. The quote says that is a true historical fact. Since we're comparing movie with the history, I knew I had to ask, is that a true historical fact? Jack, my friend, you're a full faced <laughs> liar. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's a widespread perception. It was something that uh, appeared in a couple of books that, that, that uh, were published in the 1950s and 1960s. But this idea that somehow Custer hoped to win a, a big Indian battle in the summer of 1876, in time to, to snare the Democratic Party uh, presidential nomination. I mean, he had no idea when, when he marched down to Fort Abraham Lincoln on May 17th, 1876, when and if he would find Indians, if he could win this victory, you know, in time to, to, to register 
uh, with the politicos back east. But something else, you know, that is now presidential nominations just don't fall into somebody's lap. You have got to establish an organization or a machine of people who are going to be, you know, doing the grassroots work, at least among convention delegates, trying to prep them for, you know, going along with the nomination of your guy. You got to have a veritable army of politicians and jobbers uh, who are doing that. And there's been no evidence that's ever surfaced that Custer had such a machine in place. No letters, no diaries, no, no even snide, subtle remarks in the newspaper. Also, you know, Indian victories. By this point in time, there are a lot of people in the East, a lot of white people in the East, where there's been no Indian threat for quite some time, who have developed a sympathy for Native peoples and tend to view the army as the bad guys attacking these poor, wrong folks. So, you know, Custer said, I want a big Indian victory. A lot of people in the East go, boo. Now, the rest, yay, you know, Indians, we see them as a threat or they're in the way of us developing certain economic resources we want to develop. But much of the West has not been organized into states. Its territories, they're not in the Electoral College, you know. So, uh, yeah, again, if, if, if this, this, is a, this is a great line. And it's a great myth. And, you know, it gives us another reason to say Custer got uh, what was coming to him at the Little Bighorn, but that wasn't a vote of motivation. Now, he was hoping, you know, like a lot of Army officers, that if he did well, he'd get promoted. To be fair, he, he was dallying in democratic politics. Uh, during the American Civil War, he was very careful to stay on the right side of the ruling Republican administration. Uh, but when Reconstruction comes along and Andrew Johnson stands in the way of Republican Reconstruction policies, Custer thinks, well, you know, the president, uh, well, he's going to win. And so Custer aligns with Johnson, whose policies are approved by the Democrats. Johnson, of course, doesn't. Uh, unless it says Grant becomes president in 1868, Custer's in the doghouse with Republicans, you ingrate, we cultivated your career. So, you know, he, he hangs with Democrats. He'd been a Democrat before the Civil War, so it was a, a, a natural proclivity there. Democrats who are eager to, to hear about perhaps Republican corruption in the West, the buying and, and, and selling of post sutler ships, you know, the, the 7-Elevens that were established on military posts, things like that. Uh, Custer will tell them what he knows. And he may have been hoping that if they won in 1876, if, if Grant, uh, well, it wouldn't have been Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, that they wouldn't have looked after him one way or the other. But he's in trouble, you know, uh, politically. Grant doesn't like him. Grant tries to remove him from command right before the Little Bighorn. So he needs a victory to vindicate himself militarily. And also, uh, he, he was offered, you know, if you have a successful campaign, we can pay you to travel around the country delivering lectures on your great victory. So he does have uh, an agenda there besides just doing his duty. You did mention Grant, uh, President Grant, Ulysses S. Grant. And that is something that the movie kind of mentions here and there, and we get the idea that Custer does not like Grant. They go, he goes off on this rant of, you know, how he became president. And then, of course, as we were just talking about, the impression the movie gives is, well, Custer wanted to be president, but Grant got to be president. They both served in the Civil War and, and Grant got it, but Custer didn't. And so there's this some sort of a bad blood between them. Was there actually some sort of rift between the two? Yeah, the relationship is interesting. I mean, they both serve together in the, uh, you know, Custer was on the Eastern Theater throughout the war from 1861 to 1865. When Grant comes out as commanding general and he takes personal command of the Army of the Potomac, Custer's part of that army. Custer contributed to several of Grant's victories and also victories won by uh, a detachment from the uh, Army of the Potomac, the Army of the Shenandoah. Custer is, is the commander who gets in front of Lee at Appomattox Courthouse 
and delays Lee long enough for the rest of the Union Army to come up to force his surrender. But Grant never really liked him. I don't, I don't exactly know why. Maybe because he was too successful at too young an age. Maybe because of his flamboyant, uh, his flamboyant character, the, the ostentatious costuming that, that may have convinced uh, Grant he was a vain pop and jay. I mean, Phil Sheridan, who, who Grant loved, was 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 Custer's uh, Custer's patron uh, and took care of Custer after the war. Uh, but, you know, Custer, after Andrew uh, uh, Johnson's political star uh, faded out in 1868, he is in a situation, he's the Army's most famous Indian fighter, but he doesn't get promoted. He, he, Lieutenant Colonel in 1866, he'll die a Lieutenant Colonel 10 years later. And, and that may have bred some bitterness. Now, I had to be careful what he said publicly, because if you could be quoted, Calling the commander in chief a drunkard, et cetera, then that would get you get you in trouble. But in 1876, uh, the Democrats control Congress. They are investigating corruption in the Grant administration, and they are investigating the War Department and the Indian Bureau. And Custer knows some things about them, and he will testify before a congressional committee in Washington. Uh, most of what he says is ruled as hearsay, but yeah, he gives his evidence and makes a splash in the papers, and this is just before he's supposed to return to the West to participate in the Great Sioux War. And Grant says, uh-oh, no, you don't. <laughs> You're not going. This creates a tremendous furor. Uh, a number of Army officers will go to Grant and say, you know, Custer, he's indispensable. This guy can find Indians, whether you like him or not. The Democratic press pile on Grant. And Grant relents. He says, well, Custer can go, but not as commander of the Dakota column, he's going to have to serve under his department commander, Brigadier General Alfred H. Terry. So he's going to be on a leash, that kind of thing. So uh, I'm sure Custer wasn't too happy about that. But the, the outbursts that Richard Mulligan voices, uh, no one ever hear, hears him say something like that. He's, he's treading on, on eggshells, as it is. Although he's headstrong. Uh, his superiors told him, Phil Sheridan said, uh, or maybe uh, uh, General Sherman, who was head of the army, tell Custer to take no reporters with him. <laughs> Custer had a nice rapport with the press, and they helped to build his reputation from the Civil War on. He takes a reporter with him, Mark Kellogg, from the Bismarck Tribune, who is syndicated in a New York newspaper. Uh, so you can't paint Custer as an innocent. He's a wheeler dealer like the politicians are. I was going to say, it, it sounds like he, he had the, he, the politics, the game of politics. He knew how to work the press and he knew how to um, make himself look good <laughs> in the yeah. eyes of, of in this people. In case, he's trying to protect his future military career. Yes, yes. Not, not right. president of the United States, but yeah. <laughs> no. The big battle at the end of the movie, the Battle of Little Big Horn, we've mentioned a, a few times now. And since the story in the movie is told from Jack Crabb's point of view, there's quite a lot of focus put on Jack's involvement in Custer's decision whether or not to go down to a place called Medicine Tail Cooley. And there's another display of Custer's vanity here to paraphrase the conversation. The major, <laughs> cast as major, suggests they send a scout team down first. Custer says, no, that would be a reversal of a Custer decision. We know he doesn't like doing that. So, uh, plus he says that would ruin the element of surprise. Major's like, surprise, they know we're here. <laughs> Customer, Custer says, yes, but they don't know that I intend to attack them without mercy. That's a surprise. Major's like, that's not a surprise. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, of course. But uh, Custer goes on to use Jack as a way to make his decision. It really seems to be a decision that he's already made. He's just looking for someone else to back him up. His reverse lauder, as he says. His yes, role. yes. And which right away I was thinking, Okay, this can't be how it happened because it, I mean, it's military and commanding officer. And we'll get to the battle in a moment. But again, I'm, I'm just assuming that is not what really happened. Can you share the true story of what really happened leading up to the battle? Yeah. Um, Custer uh, rendezvous with a column of uh, troops coming out of Montana on the Yellowstone River. And there's a council of war up aboard that fence supply steamer I mentioned, the Far West, on June 21st, 1876. 
a lot of Custer subordinates, Major Marcus A. Reno, let's give the Major a name, had come across an Indian trail leading about half the regiment on a scout. And using that intelligence, Custer uh, is sent to follow that trail and try to find those Indians. The other uh, half of the Army troops that are there are going to circle around to the west, uh, uh, to the north of Custer, and hopefully the two columns can kind of converge. And one or the other will run into Indians. The Indians will be caught between two columns, and if, if they run away from the one coming from the south under Custer, they'll run into the other one, and vice versa, that kind of thing. So they set out, and uh, as Custer marches uh, on his route, he hits the Indian trail, and he finds that there are all kinds of Indians joining it. It's getting wider and wider and wider. So Custer says, okay, this is the one. This is not some small band off on its own. This, this, this is worth following and worth hitting. And he will follow it into the Valley of the Little Bighorn. Uh, on the night of, of the uh, 24th of June, his scouts will go out to a, to a position called the Crow's Nest, kind of an overlook, and, and then they will uh, determine the location of the village. They'll bring Custer out there early morning, uh, try to point it out to him. He says, I don't see anything, but he believes them. And his plan is to try to get as close as he can to that village without alarming its occupants uh, on the 25th and hit at dawn on the 26th of June, just like he did at the Washington. Hit them while they're still asleep, you know, while their the reactions are going to be slow and score score a victory. But he hears that uh, that he's been spotted. Some mule skinner who didn't do a good job because Custer was uh, subsisting off a, a mule train because you could move faster and over rough country with mules carrying your supplies rather than wagons. Then a box of hardtack had fallen off and troopers were sent back to retrieve it and they found a couple of Sioux Indians prying it open and they fired it up and the Indians took off. And they just naturally assumed they're heading for the village. But they did it. Uh, but Custer thinks we've been discovered. We got to move it and hit now before this camp disperses. And they're gone. And he's uh, moving down into the valley along a stream called, a tributary called Wolf Creek. And when he gets fairly close, one of his uh, interpreters, a fellow named Fred Girard, who's on a rise off to the side, yells, there go your Indians, general, running like the devil. And they spot about 40 Indian warriors just streaking away from the column. They think, well, they're going to get to the village. They don't go there either. <laughs> Indians don't have a good alarm system. So Custer decides, regardless of that, I've got to attack these Indians. And he orders Major Marcus A. Reno to take three of the regiment's 12 companies across the river and attack the camp from the south. Custer says, I will support you with the whole outfit. He also sends a Captain Frederick H. Benteen with three companies veering further south to make sure there are no Indians getting away in that direction. He wants them all. As he gets closer with the five troops, the five companies left under his immediate command, he gets intelligence that this village is extending north. So I think the best way to support Reno is to go up north, find some break in the bluffs, a coulee leading down into the river valley, and, and, and attack the Indians on the flood. So that's what he does. All of this is based on the expectation that these Indians are pulling stakes, they are packing up, and they're getting ready to run. You know, this is based on his past experience as an Indian fighter. But doggone it, these Indians don't do what's expected. They don't uh, conform to the pattern. By this point, uh, the Lakota and their allies, they've been so squeezed, they've been so pushed around that they feel, you know, our days of living free are coming to an end. And if that's the case, We'd rather die free than die as paupers at the mercy of the whites. The battle cry wasn't the usual, you know, if you run into a large group of white soldiers, run away to fight again another day. It's hooka hey, it is a good day to die. Which we mentioned, see, we hear that in the movie. It's a good day to die. Day to die, really, yeah. Uh, and so Custer, you know, uh, Major Reno uh, with, with 120 guys, he's uh, attacking from the south. All these Indians come boiling out because there are a couple thousand warriors in that camp and they are ready for a fight. They want to fight. 
Reno uh, decides to retire to some timber uh, and fight dismounted, but the Indian pressure is so great that he panics and races away, tells his troops to follow him and try to gain some bluffs, uh, hills on the other side of the Little Bighorn River. The Indians chase him and they, they chop his command to pieces. They, they kill about a third of his men. Custer doesn't know this. The last thing he saw of Reno, Reno was in the valley fighting the Indians in the open. Custer continues north. He's looking for a break in those bluffs, and he finds Medicine Tail Coulee. And he'll send two companies down there of his five, and they're met with Indian resistance, and they'll fall back, and he decides, this isn't a good place to, to cross the river. I'm going to go further north. Uh, and he'll take those two companies and leave three behind to kind of hold the way open for uh, for Major Reno and, and Captain Benteen to reach. After he decided to make this attack, he sent a, a note to... Uh, to Benteen uh, to call him from his scout to the south. And it went roughly, Benteen, big village, come quick. You know, bring packs, meaning bring the ammunition packs. Be quick. So he wants reinforcements. He, need, he knows he needs more men. He knows he needs reinforcements. But at the same time, he's trying to keep the initiative by splitting his command uh, first into three parts, Benteen, uh, Reno, and his own command, and then by taking two troops away from the other three and going further north, he makes it possible for the Indians. I mean, Reno, they chew him up. Reno runs away. He's no longer a threat. They turn on Custer. He's the existential threat. He's within range of their women and children. And they go after him. They wipe out the three companies that he left behind. He gets the last stand hill with his two remaining companies and tries to make a stand. And they'll whittle him down. Uh, most of the Indians get off their horses because it's stupid to ride around in a circle and let people shoot you. And they take cover and they're firing arrows and bullets and they whittle down uh, the number of whites until there's very little fire coming from uh, the circle of dead white horses. And then they go in and they kill whoever's still left to resist and kill any wounded who are still alive. And that brings the battle, a battle to a close. Custer dies on that hill. He's in the last stand group. When did he go down at the beginning of this final phase of the battle? At the end, we'll never, we'll never know. But uh, yeah, so the movie doesn't show that at all. Custer takes the entire set of the cavalry and they go down Medicine Tail Coulee. Some Indians are waiting for them not to fight, but as decoys. And they go riding away. And Custer, instead of going into the village, which is his primary objective, because again, if he captures women and children, he can use them as hostages to uh, get the warriors to you know, more or less uh, uh, stop resisting. He goes chasing these decoys and he gets ambushed. And th that was a common belief that, that somehow the Indians ambushed Custer rather than reacting to his mistakes, taking advantage of his mistakes. That somehow they had set a trap for him. Another thing about the, the, the presentation of Custer and the, the Battle of the Little Bighorn is that it epitomizes what I call reverse racism. That the only white officer that Indians could beat is an evil, foolish man. They can't take out a competent officer and, and beat him in an open fight. Only idiots uh, get defeated by Indians. And that really isn't fair to the Lakota and Cheyenne. They found a worthy foe. Now, he made, a, made mistakes. But that's what you do when you're fighting a worthy foe. If he gives you an opening, then you take it. And and you you attack without mercy, especially since you you feel your wife and your wives and children. Well, you're talking about uh, Custer using his plan of attack was kind of based on his experience uh, fighting Indians previously. Do we know if the Indians who were fighting him had experience that they were using in their strategy to to fight against? Custer to take advantage of those mistakes, to realize that they were mistakes to take advantage of? Well, you know, a lot of the fighting men, except for the youngest, had experience. The camp he attacked at the Washington were, were full of Southern Cheyenne. Some of those people moved north afterwards. So there were Washington veterans uh, at, at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which uh, uh, some people see as a kind of, you know, some uh, form of divine, divine intervention or divine retribution. Certainly, there, there's great irony there. But these Indians, you know, they've been fighting other Indians, been fighting whites. And when they're involved in a combat situation, they, if they see the, the enemy um, 
doing something that makes them vulnerable, they'll take advantage of it. I mean, they weren't organized in military units, but there were certain certain leaders who commanded respect, like Crazy Horse, like Gaul, like Two Moon, etc. And they'd say, look, look, the soldiers, uh, we're on this side of, the, of this ridge, and they're, they're held horses. They're fight, firing in the other direction, other idiots. Let's stampede their horses, and they will be helpless. Uh, and other guys say, it's a good idea, let's do it. <laughs> so they do that. Uh, Crazy Horse, the three troops that Custer left behind, by uh, using Indian testimony and time motion studies and archaeological evidence, it appears that he made a danger run. He rode through the whites and came back without getting a scratch. And he said, I can do it. You can do it. Let's go. And that helped to destroy those three, those three companies at, at the southern end of, uh, of Custer's Ridge. And there were other, other Indian leaders who would do the same thing, just like a squad leader. Uh, in the World War II, it stand up, follow me. <laughs> One Indian a Cheyenne leader who did that lame white map was killed, whether it was by white bullets or by friendly fire. But he exposed himself to encourage other Indians to carry out a certain tactic. So it's a lot of small unit action that's going on. There's no Indian Napoleon at the little big horn, but you don't need one. That is very, very different than the way the movie portrays any of that, <laughs> especially like we, in the, in the, in the battle, um, in the movie, you see elements of things that we've talked about here where you cut everybody around him is fighting and Custer's just going on this rant against Grant and how it was his fault that he's in this position and, and all of this. And then of course, you know, you do see, uh, Jack Crabb being the lone white survivor <laughs> as he's managed to escape in the story there, there, comes together but we, we've talked about there were no white survivors like jack crab that that, that uh, you know depiction of custer that that fits with with how the character is framed uh from his first appearance uh in the movie burger you know uh considers custer something of a jerk but at the end uh jack crab admires the bravery that Custer displays and encouraging his man and trying to try to salvage something out of that out of that situation. Custer still gets killed, uh, but uh, again, movies often paint with a broad brush. And uh, when you consider the the politics of the day that the movie was made, Arthur Penn, uh, the director, was something of an anti-authoritarian. I mean, they just previously turned two bloodthirsty uh, bank robbers, Bonnie and Clyde, into glamorous glamorous heroes. Uh, Custer's the establishment to him. Custer's the U.S. Army. Custer's every, every dim-witted general who led, led his troops into disaster and caused all kinds of collateral damage wherever he can be found. So we're dealing with a caricature here and a th thinly disguised uh, a picture of a modern U.S. general. Well, at the very end of the movie, we see the character of Old Lodgkins tell Jack that we won the battle but not the war. What was the aftermath of the Battle of Little Bighorn? Well, you know, uh, close to about, uh, again, estimates vary, but about 8,000 Indians came together in the Valley of Little Bighorn. Now, we're talking about maybe 2,000, 2,500 warriors, the rest are women and children, non -competence. It takes an awful lot of buffalo to feed a concentration like that. Mm. And the very numbers scare game out of an area. So the, that number of Indians just couldn't stay together for long. They had to break up to hunt, to feed. And as they're doing that, word of Custer's defeat reaches the, uh, reaches the east, and the U.S. Army's got agonite space. Well, we've got to send reinforcements, and we've got to hunt these people down. So they'll do that. Now, it's still very difficult because it's the summertime. The ponies are flat, or fat, sorry, uh, because the grass is green. Uh, and, and these Indians... Uh, elude uh, the soldiers time and again, but they can't keep out forever. And so different bands are being hit at different places. And uh, most of the army retires to winter quarters when the snows fall, but an infantry commander named Nelson Miles stays out. Uh, he establishes a cantonment or camp on the Tongue River. And he says, maybe horses, uh, army horses can't subsist on the plains uh, because they can't pull down to the grass and we can't haul oats out for them. But my infantry can go anywhere. 
he commanded the 5th U.S. Infantry, and by gum, he, he does. And he starts hitting Indian camps, and again, he just don't expect the white soldiers to show up. He starts capturing Indian ponies and mounting his infantry on them, which increases his mobility. But between him and other commanders, Ronald McKenzie, uh, et cetera, they make life really tough. They hit camps, and they destroy Indians' habitations, all their stored food, uh, either capture or kill ponies. These people can't survive. So they, band after band starts coming in to surrender at their agencies. Some, uh, uh, Lakota, uh, and that includes Crazy Horse, you know, as hard line of resistors you could find. A small group of people uh, under the leadership of, of Sitting Bull, who was the spiritual leader of, of the Lakota during this resistance, they will go into Canada to escape being subjected to the United States, but they, they don't like it. <laughs> and they'll return eventually and be put on a reservation. Government will keep a close eye on Sitting Bull. We'll allow it for a while to tour with Buffalo Bill's Wild West. But in the end, uh, when the ghost dance uh, disturbances rise up in 1889, 1890, there's a suspicion that he, he might be behind it uh, and he'll be assassinated by Indian police. Crazy Horse in 1877, he's bayoneted to death under the suspicion that he was planning resistance. I think that was at Fort Robinson, Nebraska. So he's eliminated too. Other Indian leaders realize that they want to stay leaders and they want to stay alive. They got to play ball with the whites. It goes into 1877 and into the fairly early months of 1877, and that pretty much breaks Indian resistance, except for Sitting Bull and his band to go to Canada. They're not resisting anybody, but they're on they're on the loose. So yeah, they grind they grind them they grind them down. That's uh, that's the way it works. Uh, attrition. Uh, the army would just keep after these people until it was impossible for them to uh, survive on their own, and then uh, the government would put them on welfare, provided they stayed within the confines of their reservations. Throughout the movie, I want to I want to ask. There was a concept for one of the character the character Younger Bear, and it mentions that he's a contrary. <laughs> it's kind of a the way the movie portrays it, it seems, again, there's a lot of over-the-top stuff, and this just seems over-the-top. He, he has a contrary. Everything except for battle has to be done backwards. He walks backwards. He says hello instead of goodbye. When, when he means goodbye, he says goodbye when he means hello. Was that an actual thing? Believe it or not, it was. Oh. Okay. It was. There were contraries. Now, they were a small cult among the Cheyenne because it was so difficult to be <laughs> contrary. Uh, but yeah, they, they would do the opposite of what everyone else was doing. People would be eating, they would, and sometimes they got into battle. Sometimes I got, I got involved in combat. The leader of a war party would tell his people, okay, the, the opposition is too tough. Let's fall back. The contrary would stay fighting. Someone would have to go to him and say, charge. <laughs> <laughs> and then <he'd> go back. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, you know, this is a, it's a uh, kind of extreme religious cult, but it, it did exist, which is, you know, was, and, and that, again, that, that was nice seeing that in other things in the movie, the depiction of the Cheyenne, you know, contrary to what, what we'd seen in Hollywood up to this time, they're not noble savages and they're not ignoble savages. They're people. They have a certain lifestyle that works for them. They have a certain belief system that, that works for them. Among themselves, they, they, they're kind, loving. Uh, they train their young people in their ways. They accept mistakes. They accept a certain amount of individuality. Oh, you want to you wanna be trans? That's okay. <laughs> I had the one character. Oh, that's fine. We got a place for you. you uh, the great spirit has somehow blessed you in, in a way distinct from everybody else uh, with people that they adopt, uh, too. You know, I take them in, in, into the family circle. And uh, some of it's funny. Like the contrary. Yeah, okay, great. You know, there are weird things going on in white culture, too, at that time. Again, as I say, they, they, they treat them as people. And, and that's one of the great beauties of this movie. You said it is following Jack Crabb, but because he does live with the Cheyenne for a long time, especially in the beginning, um, and then he does go back at different times throughout the movie, it sounds like it does a pretty good job of showing what life may have been like for Cheyenne in the 1800s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, he's happiest when he's with the Cheyenne. Uh, the people are more honest, <laughs> are more transparent. What you see is what you get. I hate you. <laughs> what you see, my life. So 
I can't hurt you right now until I save your life. Then I can kill you. <laughs> You're just stuck in this. It makes you laugh, but at the same time, okay? You know, I can see feeling that way. At least, at least you know. <laughs> yeah. You know where you stand. Right? Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. The film, though, you know, uh, far from the science, pretty misogynistic, which is not that all untypical for movies made in the 1970s. Women are, uh, well, you know, if I could use the, the B word, you've got Olga who turns into this, this nasty bitch while she's married to poor younger bear. Uh, you've got uh, the, the hypocritical uh, Victorians, Mrs. Pendrake, you know, beneath that Christian veneers, somebody who is just as savage and primeval in her needs. And she's the people that uh, she snares at. Um, Sunshine. Uh, Jack Crabbe's Cheyenne wife. Now, she's lovely in many ways. Uh, she's, in many ways, a perfect woman. Although, uh, you know, this is not as misogynistic. She knows how to manipulate Jack. <laughs> I want you, to, I want you to, to have sex with my sisters. Cause they, they've lost their husbands and, and, and they're lonely. Uh, but uh, and Caroline, you know, his sister, who, who you, you can tell she's aching to be raped by the Indians. You know, she's disappointed when they don't do that. So there's some really, really odd female portraits in, in this film. But uh, uh, Berger's novel kind of opens in that spirit when Jack Crabbe's wagon train, when he's a boy, is attacked. They kill all the white men, but then uh, they drag the women off and rape them. And instead of adhering to the, uh, the stereotype of the, 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 white, the, the white pioneer woman, save the last bullet for yourself, spare yourself a fate worse than death, they all submit. And then the next day, they put their clothes back on. It's business as usual. <laughs> uh, so there's that odd moment. If you sit down and think about some of these things, there are things to think about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it, it seems like we, we talked about various elements here, but it also seems just a lot of stereotypes that we've seen in other Western movies as well. Is there anything that you wish had been included that wasn't? Well, you know, I'm going to be the persnickety historian. I said, I wish they had shown the battle as it actually was, and that more, more than half the 7th Cavalry survived on Reno Hill and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I take it on its own terms. I mean, I was upset by it when I first saw it when I was a teenager, and, oh, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right. But it works as entertainment, and at times it delivers more than that. And... um there aren't that many movies that you could say that about, or, you know, I wish there were more movies that you could say that about. So, uh, don't take it, don't, don't treat it as a history text. But there are things to be appreciated. And, you know, and, and one thing worth appreciating is that they filmed a lot of the battle on the Little Bighorn Battlefield. Not the National Park, but a lot of the land over which the fighting occurred. Uh, is not part of the National Park. It's part of the Crow Reservation. Medi they, sh they filmed in Medicine Tail Coulee. Oh, okay. We went down to the Ford where, where Custer's troops didn't, didn't cross. Uh, most of the Indian extras, though, uh, were not Lakota or, or Cheyenne. They were Crow because that's their homes. And uh, the production company went in looking for young Indians who could ride horses. And, and so the Crow, uh, Crow makes some money. And... Uh, and, uh, and they, they had a, they had a high old time working, working on that. Uh, I had a friend who was a ranger at the Custer battlefield today, a little bighorn battlefield. And, uh, during the shooting, uh, cause they're riding horses down bluffs and things like that. Masses of people, the horse fell and broke its neck or had to be put out of its misery. And there was a complaint because the film production company didn't remove the carcass and the smell would, 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 uh, I reached the visitor center and they, the government couldn't go over there and, and do it. Park service couldn't go over there and, and, and remove it because it wasn't their land. The crows didn't seem to care because it wasn't near where they were living. I'm glad they, they did that though, to add a little bit of authenticity to at least the, the terrain. Cause a lot of times in movies too, they it's, it's a studio or it's somewhere just completely different and it, desert. Yeah, yeah. You know, or it's flat. Yeah. You know? So yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about Little Big Man, uh, one of your books called Custer Victorious, the Civil War Battles of General 
George Armstrong Custer. I'll make sure to include a link to that in the show notes for this episode for anyone who wants to pick up a copy. But since that's obviously about a different part of Custer's career than the story we talked about today, can you share an overview of your book for someone who wants to learn more about him? Well, when I developed my interest in Custer, everything about him was about the little bighorn. The last day of his life, about which we know hardly anything. You, you know, he, well, the archaeology and a more intelligent reading of, of Indian testimony has, has increased our knowledge of the overview. You know, we, we didn't know what he was thinking. Uh, we could we speculate. One reason why Custer's defeat made such an impact on, on the psyche of the American people was that he went into the Little Bighorn as an established national hero. And that reputation was born in the American Civil War, when a young man who graduated last in his class at West Point in June 1861, within two years was a brigadier general and soon became uh, the commander of probably the best cavalry unit, uh, cavalry brigade in the Army of the Potomac, and then went on to become the, uh, uh, the commander of the best cavalry division in the Army of the Shenandoah and then the Army of the Potomac, all before he was 25. Uh, and he helped to win countless battles that were a lot bigger and a lot more important than the Little Bighorn uh, because they helped to preserve the Union. And I just, you know, thought, this deserves a closer look. So when I, the time came for me to write my master's thesis in 1979 at John Kerry University, I uh, hope the Jesuits appreciate the plug, I had decided to write my thesis on Custer in the Civil War. And my advisor, uh, the Reverend Donald J. Smythe, uh, S.J., a Jesuit, who was also the biographer of John G. Pershing, he knew I'd been writing magazine articles and stuff. He said, why don't you write it as a book? And I did. And uh, after some revisions and trying to find a, a publisher foolish enough to invest in me, it came out in 1983 as Custer Victorious. This is its 40th anniversary. And it just more or less uh, gives a, a, a different look at Custer, a look at Custer when he was successful, when he apparently could do no wrong. And I thought that that, you know, that was important, that this guy was not some, some lame brain like Richard Mulligan depicted. Uh, whatever personal foibles he may have had, he was good on the battlefield. That, I think, puts the little bighorn in a new light. So they're saying, okay, we're going to look at how this fool just doomed himself and a couple of hundred men to death. What would a reasonable commander, why would he make these decisions? And the whole thing, again, you know, again, image, uh, Custer got his home command massacred. As I said, there were 210 men under his immediate command, another 50 guys under Reno and Benty who didn't survive. But what about Robert E. Lee, who got three divisions massacred, marching them across open ground against mass Union artillery and Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. What about Ulysses S. Grant at Cold Harbor, uh, ordering his troops to attack and trench Confederates, uh, 7,000 men killed in 15 minutes? You know, wh 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 what's your yardstick for measuring these kinds of things? Even good generals can have bad days. Even good general, you don't you don't have to admire Custer to say, well, you know, he, he had certain qualities, he, he had uh, he had certain successes, or certain things he just seemed to know how to do right, but everything seemed to go wrong for him on June twenty fifth, eighteen seventy six. So uh, uh, Custer victorious, it's still in print. Surprisingly enough, he just got a, a prize from the Little Bighorn Associates uh, this past June. Uh, they honor books that they didn't honor when they initially uh, <laughs> appeared with this J.D. Smith Award. So it's still out there. People are still reading it. And it has affected the way at least uh, Civil War historians look at Custer in that larger conflict. So it made a little contribution there. Yeah, I, th I think you um, make a great point of, well, nobody, nobody survived. And so especially it sounded like what you're talking about earlier, right away there seemed to be some, you know, the, me the media and the way that they portrayed things or there was just a lot of hearsay or i mean nobody sur nobody survived so yeah i mean so you can make up your own story yeah yeah so we don't we don't know as opposed to civilization or if you're a republican that nasty little brat yeah got yeah this which is that's what grant said words which is needless sacrifice of men oh really okay okay yeah yeah well, thank you again so much for your time. We'll make sure to include a link to your book in the show notes for this episode. 
Thank you very much. My pleasure. It's always a pleasure to be on Based on a True Story. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Gregory J.W. Uren once again for sharing his expertise about the historical accuracy of 1970s Little Big Man. And as he talked about, Gregory's excellent book on Custer is called Custer Victorious, The Civil War Battles of General George Armstrong Custer. So if you want to go beyond how Custer is portrayed in the movie and learn more about the true story, you'll find a link to where you can get his book in the show notes for this episode. Speaking of episodes, Gregory has been on the podcast before to talk about another Custer movie, 1941's They Died With Their Boots On. That's episode number 198 of Based on a True Story. So if you want to hear more about Custer and the Battle of Little Bighorn, you can find that in the podcast app that you're using right now to listen. Or if you're driving or unable to do that right now, as always, you can find a link to it on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. And you'll find a link to get Gregory's excellent book there as well. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a quick refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one. Jack Crabb was a fictional character. Number two, Custer wanted to win at Little Bighorn so he would be nominated for president. Number three, there really was such a thing as a contrary among the Cheyenne. Did you catch which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. Jack Crabb was a fictional character. That is true. And by true, I mean it's true that he did not exist. <laughs> we learned that Jack Crabb was a character from the satirical book the movie was based on. So the movie didn't make him up, but he was made up nonetheless. That brings us to number two. Custer wanted to win at Little Bighorn so he would be nominated for president. That's the lie. There were multiple points that Gregory made about this. For example, he pointed out that securing the nomination for president of the United States was and still is, something that requires a political machine to secure the support needed. And there's no evidence that Custer had that in place. That means number three is also true. There really was such a thing as a contrary among the Cheyenne. As we learned, although the movie's depiction of a contrary is obviously satirical, as is the entire movie, the concept of a contrary actually does have basis in reality. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. I really hope you've learned something new. If you got some value out of today's episode, consider giving some value back. You can give back whatever you feel you got out of this episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash value. Or you can give back some value simply by sharing this episode with a friend or family member who you think would enjoy it. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <music>